Bill. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. It's a great, great pleasure to, to be here and have a chance to speak to you. Um, and I guess while it's loading up, yeah, so the history, it's all intertwined. I actually was recruited by the S Center for Applied Cryptologic Cryptographic Research to start a quantum computing group within the Cryptography Center. And as, a Scott, as Scott Vanstone always told me, we hired you to keep an eye on you. <laughs> it's like, you know, we hope you're successful, but not too soon. Um, so it was, I think, an appropriate tactic at the time. You know, you couldn't have a 21st century cryptography center without some awareness of how quantum was going to disrupt it. And actually, I started in the early 90s with classical cryptanalysis, index calculus attacks. When I heard of quantum computing, I thought it was a joke. And then I, when I realized they were serious, then I thought it was just crazy. Um, well, the, thinking it was a joke, I heard about it. I met Don Coppersmith, who was, had been one of my heroes. I was reading all his papers on, on the index calculus and so on. I, I met him at crypto and asked him, so what are you working on? And, and he told me, because he actually helped Peter Shore improve Shore's algorithm, um, the, the quantum Fourier transform part. So he told me what he was talking about. Okay, we're going to encode the arithmetic on a string of atoms, and, and then we're going to do this Fourier transform to extract the period. And I thought he was joking. <coughs> So I, asked, I said, you know, and you're going to publish that in the National Enquirer? And then, and then he got a bit annoyed. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I just insulted, you know, one of my heroes. Um, and then I, so then anyway, then I dismissed, I still, you know. And then year, two years later at Oxford, my supervisor, Dominic Welsh, said, you should go talk to the physicists. And I said, okay, you know, I didn't, I was just doing it because he told me to. Uh, and then eventually I realized I was wrong, like this will eventually work. It was a matter of time. So the, anyway, the Cryptography Center recruited me to start a quantum computing group, and I quickly set out to set up a sort of multidisciplinary center, which we grew into the Institute for Quantum Computing. And in the meantime, the, the Center for Applied Cryptologic Research, Cryptographic Research, <coughs> grew into um, the Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute at the University of Waterloo. So, one of the challenges, the collective challenge I think we all face for those of us who are concerned about protecting our systems in the so-called cyber world, in a world where we're so dependent on digital technologies for computation and communication and so on, is security is still an afterthought. Security by design is still not a universally accepted principle. Um, so there's one quote uh, by Michael mm -hmm. Hayden. I think it's helpful to say it's not just the academics who say this. You know, former head of the NSA and CIA, essentially, you know, framed it as, you know, we rush to put all our information, all our assets in, from physical space into cyberspace because it's so convenient without really thinking through what it meant, what the security implications were. Um, and in cyberspace, it's a very flat space, advantages to the adversary, right? And he said, shame on us for the Office of Personnel Management hack. You know, that, that was our fault, I mean, meaning the United States, I'm, I'm Canadian, but <coughs> meaning the United States, um, and, and so on. So it's a, actually an amazing read, uh, this Wall Street, Street Journal interview, just highlighting that we have a long way to go in terms of taking security seriously and fully uh, internalizing all, all the, the real, real consequences of our decisions today. Now, we're very well aware that cryptography is, you know, one piece of achieving security, in, in the context of, of modern technology, but in a sense, it's an essential piece. If you want to embrace the capabilities offered by untrusted infrastructures, such as the internet, you need cryptography. Cryptography is the sort of magic, it's not magic, it's sort of magic that works, as, my, my, uh, as Neil Turok used to say about physics. Uh, it's what allows you to take information, hand it over to a very untrusted medium, and still get trustworthy results out of it. So technically you could live in a world without cryptography, but then you rely purely on trusting individuals, trusting physical devices, and so on. But if you add cryptography as that third piece, you get you unleash this amazing uh, power. Right? This capability of sharing this massive untrusted infrastructure and still getting reliable results out of it. Now, people will say, you know, Security, you know, your secure is your weakest link, and cryptography right now is our strongest link, so stop talking to me about cryptography. 
Um, so I'll, two issues with that, and I'll get to one of them shortly. But just first off, cryptography has to be the strongest link in the sense that it's the only one that is susceptible to a record now, decrypt later type attack. The, the tr compromising a human, you can't clone a person, put them in a freezer, and, and bribe them 20 years from now. Right? So all the, you know, you can't take advantage of side channel attacks or, or real-time network security flaws after they've been patched. But crypto, you can. You can record now um, and decrypt later. So in some sense, it needs to be more secure because it doesn't suffice to be secure in real time. You have to be secure against tomorrow's attacks that you don't even know about yet. So we do need it to be a very, very exceptionally strong link. One challenge we face when we're with this, um, you know, in terms of trying to argue for stronger cryptography is people say, look, there's so many other vulnerabilities. You're just adding this to an already overwhelming pile. And, you know, so leave me alone, I'm busy. But if you rank them from bad to worse, in terms of their impact, should they happen, you know, user errors are probably one of the most common ways people compromise our systems, right? But user error, there's a cost, but you can remediate. You reduce the likelihood of a user error, right? If, well, we need to get better at that, but, you know, we have researchers who are working on that, uh, so I don't mean to minimize. So we, we try to reduce, we try to detect when an error has occurred and the consequences are happening, and we remediate. Now, okay, and then corrupt users, they're especially, they can cause a little more damage. Admin errors, in a sense, uh, or worse, a corrupt admin, very recently a uh, major bank in Canada was compromised by an insider. <coughs> Six million customers were affected. Huge, huge, they're still reeling uh, from that. Platform implementation errors, like Heartbleed and so on, <coughs> it's bad. It's just a buffer overflow. It's not hard to fix but it can take a year to get it fixed and deployed through all the quality assurance, backwards compatibility testing, and so on and so on. A lot of exposure, very systemic exposure. So very scary stuff. <clears throat> this is, summarizes the first order, most of what we would see today in the newspapers. Now one might argue, well, you should renormalize by the frequency of these things happening, and that's correct. But a platform design error would be a much harder thing to recover from. Because you don't just spend the weekend fixing it and then the next few weeks and months deploying, you have to redesign. I mean, there's a lot of practical challenges to redesigning something and then redeploying. And it's hard to compare, but a crypto implementation error is arguably worse depending on the circumstances because it can affect multiple platforms. Okay? It's easier in the sense that, well, you fix the implementation. You don't have to go back to the design table. So in some sense, these two are incomparable. They're both very, very bad, right? They're much worse than most things we face today. And at the bottom of the stack, in my opinion, is if you have fundamental, fundamentally vulnerable cryptography, what do you remediate with? You can't redeploy the cryptography that people now know how to break, right? If the failover isn't ready, right? And we're not, we don't have that robustness built into our systems. One can argue, now you could argue that, but 15 years ago you couldn't, if RSA is broken, we have ECC. Well, I guess back then they argued we have Diffie-Hellman, right, or ECC uh, in, a, in a finite field. Eventually, elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman. So that was sort of our failover, but the truth is most systems are not set up for a quick flip to the other. I think that's different now. I think things like TLS are, are pretty agile, <coughs> could use ECC in many instances, but I think you'll find many other instances where it's not so easy to just flip over to a Diffie-Hellman-like system. So you know, even if 90% of the infrastructure is OK, 10% is still a ma massive problem. Um, so if, you know, again, it's, it's, it's much worse in the sense that you have a digital key to the front door. So you can't just lock it again, because they'll just open it again. So it, it poses a, a very unprecedented you know, business continuity problem, because you don't have a real viable remediation plan. So it is something one should worry about. It's not something we've really faced in the modern era. In any, you know, you know there have been, you know, MD5 has been broken and SHA-1, but fortunately it happened in a sufficiently gradual way uh, that there were no massively, you know, bad impacts. But if 
Tomorrow, somebody figures out how to factor numbers efficiently, publishes some scripts on the internet. Like it's a serious problem that we've never, un unlike anything we've ever faced before. Again, not to, uh, not to say these other things at the top of the stack don't need our attention. They definitely do because they're hurting us badly today. Uh, it just adds to an already uh, growingly difficult pile of problems we face. And guess what? It just keeps getting worse, and the sensor's always new. Uh, unexpected capabilities and vulnerabilities. How they're used against us <coughs> is very novel as well, right? You know, we're getting, you know, basically cyber crime as a service, and it's getting increasingly sophisticated, and they're going higher up the value chain in terms of what kind of... They're not just selling you malware. They're not just selling you access to a botnet. You can get a DDoS, you know, service, for example, and it's only going to continue to evolve. Um, and as technologies evolve, AI is coming on the horizon. Well, AI, machine learning, you know, advanced machine learning and automation. Um, it it's offers many wonderful things, but can also be used to, you know, pr produce very hard to detect phishing attacks or spear phishing attacks in an automated way, right? You can use it to defend as well, but you can also use it to attack. And in this flat landscape, overall advantages to the attacker. So one very disruptive new paradigm right, is quantum computing. The idea was formulated in the early 80s and it's gone from what one might characterize as science fiction to a reality, at least the first generation of the reality. Right, here's a chip, a picture of a chip from a few years ago. These little loops, they're actually quite large, right? We generally think, oh, quantum mechanics, that's at the subatomic scale. We never see it with the naked eye. Well, nowadays you can. This is just a few microns. And there's a loop. I'm going to oversimplify, but look, there's different energy levels depending on the current, going clockwise, counterclockwise. And there's many, many degrees of freedom, but you can actually pin down two that form a two-dimensional space in which you can encode a bit. Sometimes we'll very loosely describe it as clockwise is zero, counterclockwise is one. The physicists, you know, are appalled by that, but roughly speaking, that's the kind of state space we're talking about. And amazingly, you can have a superposition of thousands of electrons going one way and thousands of electrons going the other way and actually maintain coherence, like quantumness. And there's four of these bits. These wiggly lines are ways to couple one bit to another. The energy level between 0 and 1 is microwave, so it's a few millimeters or centimeters, and you can couple you know, the, the, zero, the energy it takes to drive a 0 to a 1 with the cavity with the, with the other qubit. So the interactions between these bits are mediated by these cavities. They're wiggly just so they could fit them on the chip. Okay? So it's very large wavelengths. It works, right? So we've gone from 4 to 10 or so to several dozens now on a chip. This is a cartoon of an ion trap proposal. We have several ions interacting with each other and you network these small registers either by physically dragging ions from one register close to another register or potentially so-called teleporting information from one register to another. And this is an actual physical gold chip that implements sort of small pieces of this larger vision. So it's coming. And people are excited to build these quantum computers and other quantum technology because of what the potential applications could be. And we have some computing applications. The same technology can be used for enhanced sensing. Okay. The, you know, the so-called, you know, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle allows you to measure things with a precision, right, and with a, that, is not possible if you restrict yourself to just classical measurements. And I'll talk a little bit about secure communication. And with any fundamentally new, you know, we're really harnessing a fundamental new understanding of nature, the, the true consequences, the true implications and applications are decades away. We, they're hard to predict in advance. Even in the 90s, who would have predicted we'd be using the internet for what we use it today? Who would have at the beginning of the 20th century imagined smartphones, right, wireless communication, leading to smartphones, or what would computers be used for when we first came up with them? So I think it's, it's impossible to predict, 
And the already exciting potential applications are just a small piece of what will happen. So in terms of you know, so-called happy quantum, uh, there's a number of applications people will hear about. I won't go into them here, uh, but these are three large areas that are being explored now, and, and surely there will be others. And given the potential value of these computation platforms, <coughs> there's now an increasing race to, to develop them and, and commercialize them. So, and we're seeing major computer vendors, it, it's now left, not left, <coughs> but it's expanded from being something that happens inside research labs at universities to being part of major companies around the world, you know, large global multinationals. That doesn't mean universities aren't very engaged, like this is a spin-off from Yale. Universities are very much a part of doing the fundamental research, making the fundamental technological advances to make the platforms more realistic and more plausible to scale. So there's a tremendous amount of fundamental innovation and discovery needed and that is being done in the universities or in the research labs of companies as the development side continues to see what they can do with the currently available technology. And we're talking about companies like Intel and Microsoft and Google and IBM who have the capacity to very quickly mobilize resources and put together teams. Like academia would be much slower to respond, like, you know, I think our processes are appropriate for what we're trying to do in, in the universities, which is the more fundamental exploration and innovation. But when there's a mission, um, then you want to, as industry gets engaged, you can much more quickly mobilize resources and put teams together and do work that is not academically interesting but needs to get done. Universities are not well optimized for that, and I don't think we necessarily should be. Uh, that when it reaches that point, then it does make sense to engage uh, with industry. And these are largely US-based, uh, mostly superconducting, a bit of ion, uh, ion traps. This is, a, I mean, Microsoft's pursuing this very audacious proposal uh, with superconducting qubits. Our friends in China, who for many years we're emerging as global leaders in quantum communication technology, including satellite quantum communication, have very recently joined the effort to build and use large-scale quantum computers with massive investments on the order of tens of billions of dollars. Right? And they're all being led, actually, the three industry teams, so there's Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, plus government and academic-led efforts, and the three industry teams are all being led by leading uh, theorists, computer scientists or physics theorists uh, who are really good and, and respected worldwide. They don't have a shortage of resources. Okay, so it's really a matter of build, attracting the intellectual capital and pursuing a long-term strategy to build and use a quantum computer. It's gone, you know, the field has gone well beyond doing these amazing physics experiments and publishing nature papers, right, with no real with not, no real readiness to actually in integrate it into a computer that one could program and use. Of course, from a first things first perspective, you have to build the thing before you worry about <coughs> programming it and using it. But we're getting close enough to having, we already have enough physical quantum bits that you can't manually program them anymore. It's just too complicated, takes too long, and you're not going to be able to do it optimally if you don't start using computers, you know, algorithms and you know, automated uh, tools. So most, I mean, essentially all the major vendors have some sort of software algorithms activity. Uh, the American ones in particular have more or less what they would describe as full stack offerings where end users can take their algorithms and compile them down to run on the hardware with an array of tools for helping them with designing and implementing and optimizing the algorithms. And we're getting more and more of the end users thinking about what quantum computers would be good for. You know, IBM says we now have 100 customers using their platform. Airbus had a quantum computing challenge, and I was one of their referees where they had five problems and they invited people to offer to work on them and propose approaches to improve these problems for their industry using quantum computers. Well, many startups, so I volunteer at this quantum incubator in Toronto advising these startups who <coughs> they're, they're looking at very concrete use cases and verticals 
you know, optimizing the rail system in this European country, right? Will any of it work? I think some of it will. I mean, a lot of it won't. But the fact that we now have end customers providing their real problems, we can now start to see how quantum might help. And in most cases, it can't. But in some cases, it can. As I tell my students, if something is 100% nonsense, there's no point in looking, right? You're not, you can't, post selection doesn't help. If something is 90% or 99% nonsense, well, that's great. You've got to find, you've got to be the world expert at finding that 1% or 10%. This is like NP, you know, this is what NP is all about. There is a solution or there isn't. If there is, we'll now find it. So the same thing with finding viable business cases for quantum computers. It's very early days, but we're seeing there's a great focus now on the software stack applications. This is our company at the bottom. So what I see happening with quantum computers today, it's still, if you're talking about quantum circuits, they're not powerful enough to be business useful. They're getting close to where maybe, if you're super, super lucky, they might be. So then why bother? Right? Well, I think it is important to start understanding what the platform can, how it can impact your business today. So people are looking at that, finding the applications. Because we don't really know the applic At a high level, we have some ideas for areas where it might impact. But that's very different from saying, here's 10. You know, if I had a quantum computer today, this is what I would use it for. And this is how I would you know, solve important problems for humanity or make lots of money, whatever. <clears throat> like there's a, there's a big gap there. And we, we need to start filling that gap and know exactly what we would use a quantum computer for. Find the applications and optimize them. When we often find out, you know, my colleagues said, hey, look, we can design, we can simulate the production of ammonia asymptotically much better than, than classical. Classically, it would take many billions of years, and with a quantum computer, it would just take a billion years. <clears throat> well, in pract practice, that maybe doesn't sound so interesting. But when they optimized the algorithm further, they brought it from a billion years down to a few months to a few minutes. Right, so there's a lot of optimization capacity. And something that initially looks like it requires a million quantum bits, if you can bring it down to a thousand, that's a really critical game changer. And I think it's very plausible, I think more likely than not, that in the next four to five years, we'll meet that critical milestone of a fault tolerant bit, which means one reliable logical quantum bit. And, and people will often extrapolate the scaling in terms of the number of qubits. And that's just a very, that's a terrible, terrible metric. Okay. People are, have been focusing on getting reliable bits, not lots of them. So don't, I wouldn't extrapolate how many they have. They can print thousands of bits on a chip if they want. They're not, except for the annealers. For people trying to build quantum circuits, they're not trying to build lots of qubits right now. They're trying to get them working well. So they got 10 or so working well, and then they went up to a few dozen. So when you're on a line or a two by two chip, it, things are a lot easier because everything, all the bits are accessible from the outside. What's well, happened in the last two to three years, they've gone to real 2D chips. And, and it's hard to get to those interior chip bits. And they all interfere with each other. You get so-called crosstalk. It's a nightmare, right? But they're learning what the errors really look like and optimizing the, gener the design of the next generation of the chips. But I think, <coughs> again, more likely than not, in the next four to five years, we'll finally get a fault tolerant quantum bit, which really is hundreds, if not thousands, of physical bits running sophisticated error correcting codes and achieving one robust logical bit. Now, in the shorter term, one, like I said, one can put D-Wave, our friends at D-Wave have put thousands of qubits on a chip, and they're implementing quantum annealing algorithms. These are algorithms where we don't have an efficient general purpose classical simulation. So it's conceivable that it can solve a useful problem, and they're working on it. I think in those cases, you know, theoretical analysis will only take you so far. You just have to demonstrate a speed up or not. And if you do, your customers won't care how you achieved it. These noisy intermediate scale devices, these are today's quantum computers based, these, these logical bits. If you have an error rate of epsilon, you could do a computation with 1 over epsilon steps. 
if epsilon is 1 in 10,000, and we're or maybe one in a thousand, that means you could do a thousand steps. That may be hard to simulate on a classical computer. Can you do anything interesting with it? I don't know. It's very speculative. To get a useful speed up with those small number of quantum operations, you, the problem has to be very, very close to, a, I think, the problem of simulating your quantum chip intuitively. Again, I would love to be proved wrong there, uh, and many of us, including myself, are trying. Uh, and I'll get to one example where that something may have been achieved. Now, this is all sort of the happy quantum story. What Peter Shore noticed in 1994 is that, by the way, it breaks public key cryptography. So he didn't just show it broke RSA, because back then, you know, our failover plan in case RSA was broken is we would use Diffie-Hellman schemes. He broke both of them at the same time. Right, so now there is no failover anymore, nothing deployed anyway. So effectively, <coughs> the security of the currently deployed public key algorithms, and here are the you know, widely used ones, goes, it's not literally zero bits, but it's poly time. So <coughs> here the security parameter is polynomial in the key length, but now the security level is polylogarithmic in the key length. So it's not literally zero, <coughs> but it's a heck of a lot less than what we need in practice. And going to bigger keys, again, the security level is polylogarithmic. You can <coughs> double your RSA key, and you're only making it a little bit harder. You only have to double the size of the computer. Okay. Against classical attacks, <coughs> you add one bit, and you've made it twice as hard to solve the problem. But you have to, <coughs> say with ECC, it's a little easier because you don't have these cube factors around. If you want to make it twice as hard to break an ECC discrete log problem on a classical computer, add one bit. Quantumly, you have to double the key length, roughly. Symmetric key crypto, here I'm putting an encryption function, but for hash functions, it roughly cuts the, 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 the bit strength in half, roughly. It's actually not quite so bad, as I'll say. So it's only quadratic, so in theory, doubling the key lengths is more than sufficient to deal with the known attacks. Could there be other attacks? Maybe. I don't have time to get into the very non-trivial results in that direction. And of course, in practice, it was pretty easy to go from SHA-1 to SHA-2 and replace MD5, so we shouldn't worry. Yes, I'm being facetious. Like, this is easy to do in theory, but in practice, we have to actually do it. So <clears throat> it doesn't keep me up at night, because. but what wor most worries me is public key crypto, but we should also think a little bit about the symmetric keys. <clears throat> Another reason it doesn't keep me up at night is, it's not in practice for the key lengths we're talking about, you don't get the full quadratic speed up. For one, quantum brute force doesn't parallelize well. So when we talk about doing 2 to the 60 work classically, it's not one processor running for time 2 to the 60. We parallelize to a large extent. And quantum par if you give me n quantum processors, so quant class quantum says instead of doing 2 to the n queries, I only need square root of 2 to the n queries. But if you, do, if you have m processors in parallel, classically the runtime goes to 2 to the n divided by m. Unfortunately for, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, the m goes under the square root. So it still helps, but it's not a full division by m. So here's a you know, simple example. If you have 2 to the 40 processors trying to brute force AS128, you have to go for time 2 to the 88. And so you shave off full 40 bits. Quantumly, you only shave off 20 bits. And also, you know, implementing these quantum, implementing those, implementing SHA and AES on a quantum computer, running Grover's algorithm, doing it fault tolerantly, there's a lot of overhead there in translating that high level algorithm to an actual circuit compile it to a fault tolerant error correcting code and then run it on your hardware <coughs> you know that there's a lot of overhead in that <coughs> which gives us a dilemma because now there's a big gap between upper and lower bound do we go conservative with the lower bound <coughs> or a little riskier and go with the current best known upper bound and the answer is depends <coughs> if it's a you know if it's not a critical asset and it's really a short term time scale that you're worried about, you can be a little riskier and go with the best known algorithms. If you're trying to prepare to do something that's supposed to be secure for 20 years, you kind of want to be closer to the lower bound. 
Because we know for sure we're going to reduce the cost of the known attacks. Are we going to get all the way to lower bounds? Probably not. So it's just the art of cryptography in terms of picking the sweet spot in practice. <clears throat> so in terms of my own work, I started looking maybe oh, seven, ten years ago at all the tools we need to take high-level circuits and compile them down to run on actual hardware. My main focus is at the top end of the stack down to an, <clears throat> a fault-tolerant quantum bit. I have other colleagues who work on optimizing how to map physical qubits into fault-tolerant qubits. And just to throw, you know, we used some brute force meet in the middle methods. We used, we borrowed ideas from Van Orschot and Wiener for parallelizing collision finding. We used some mathematical methods in terms of representing unitary operators in a clever way. Uh, we used matroid partitioning. We've used, we've reduced, you know, if we get a better read Muller decoder, we can optimize these algorithms even better. So we never know what area, I mean, my background's in pure mathematics and combinatorics, and we just never know what area of mathematics we'll need to optimize and improve the compilation of these circuits. So just to give you a little taste, you know, meet in the middle, and we parallelized it. This is somewhat easy to see. If you want to, if you give me a, a unitary, op a quantum operation, you want to implement it on a quantum computer, and you want to do it with as few fundamental gates as possible, Often the best thing we know how to do is just to try every circuit of a given cost, see if it equals what you want. If that doesn't work, go up again and keep going. So it's brute force search, the cost is exponential. So if you're trying to synthesize U, the unitary U, into a circuit, what you could do is, instead, let's say the circuit has depth 10. So you have cost exponential, some constant to the power of 10 is the cost of brute force searching. If instead you enumerate all depth 5 circuits, multiply them by u, and look for a collision with all depth 5 circuits, right? because if, if there's a depth 10 circuit, you can split it in half. The inverse <coughs> times u is going to equal the other half. So you can find a collision between these two lists. So you get some v inverse times u is equal to w. Well, u is v times w. So you get quadratically improved brute force searching. At a high level, that's simple. In practice, we came up with a lot of clever methods to encode these things as cheaply as possible and search through these as quickly as possible. And with Olivia, we turn this into a collision finding, a claw finding algorithm. For each, we, each of these is an f at x. Each of these is a g at y. We want to find an x and a y such that f at x equals g at y. We use Van Orschot Wiener. Right? And we found some circuits that hadn't been found before. So we're borrowing some very nice tools from cryptanalysis. <clears throat> we found, without the parallelization, we found a much more efficient compilation of the Toffoli circuit. Toffoli gate <coughs> is just a, a very standard gate in reversible computation. You flip the third bit if and only if the first two bits are one. So it's a, actually an AND gate. It's a reversible AND gate. And the best known methods prior to our work had it, now, I guess I should say, when you compile down to a finite set of gates, it, there's always, <clears throat> there's just no free lunch theorem, basically, that says one of those gates is going to be really, really, really hard to implement uh, fault tolerantly. And by most, by the most commonly used schemes, the T, so-called T gate, it's a one logical qubit gate, it looks innocent enough, it's just really, it's not transversal, it's hard to implement fault tolerantly. So this is one or two orders of magnitude more expensive than all the other gates. So naturally, our first order optimization is reduce the number of T gates and, and pack them into as few layers as possible if you want to reduce the depth, the total time. Previously, it was a T depth 5 compilation of that circuit. We brute force found a T depth 3 circuit. So we reduced the depth of, and that's if you, most of your quantum circuits are error correction, are doing error correction. Toffoli's are our biggest part of error correction circuits. So it's a large improvement on practical quantum circuits. Our friend Peter Selinger <coughs> realized with ancillary qubits, you can get the depth down to one. So it's a pretty slick observation. And we, re we recognize what Peter was doing <coughs> 
Okay, I don't have time to get into the details of it, but we generalized it and realized he was really optimal. You know, we could generalize it to any subcircuit that consists of so-called controlled NOT gates and those T gates. Because what any circuit out of these gates do, what does, is it takes a string of bits, does a permutation of the bits, and introduces these phase factors, as we call them. If you look at the structure of the phase factors, you can see how they're constructed, and you can see it could pretty much bring anything down to depth. Any C0 mm -hmm. and T circuit can be done in depth one if you add enough insula bits. And if you restrict the number of insula bits, the optimization problem turns out to be a matroid partitioning problem. Okay. So, and Edmonds, who's also in my department, in the 70s came up with a polytime matroid partitioning algorithm. So we applied this algorithm and were able to reduce the depth of, again, I, it's actually not that complicated, but I, I, I just want to get to the second part of my, t or finish the last part of my talk. But we significantly reduced the T count as well as the T depth of many circuits in, in a benchmark suite using matroid partitioning. Like I would never have imagined, <coughs> Dominic Welsh wrote one of the classic textbooks in matroid theory. He was my, my master's supervisor, my PhD co-supervisor. I never worked on matroids, but I had to learn what they were, because otherwise I wouldn't know what they were talking about at tea time. <coughs> at Oxford, it was, you know, tea time was when everyone got together. <coughs> so I learned what a matroid was. Um, you know, whenever I wanted to work on a matroid problem, they would kindly translate it to a graph theory problem for me. Uh, <coughs> So I knew what it was, and they were able, I was very excited that I was finally able to do something useful with matroids. <coughs> I guess I won't have a chance to explain this one in more detail, but another problem is we often get a phase gate. Now to a physicist, they'll look at a phase gate and they say, well, how hard is that? <coughs> That's just a fraction of a z-pulse, no big deal. That's true at the physical layer, but if you want to fault tolerantly implement a z-gate, a z-gate, you have to compile it into a product of many of these T, P, and H gates and implement them fault tolerantly. And again, the T gates are the most expensive ones to implement fault tolerantly. It turns out, like you could take one, so in one case, if you want to implement a pi over 10 rotation with precision, not, not very high, something like 10 to the minus 5, using the state-of-the-art methods at the time, you'd get a circuit of length over 100,000 gates which is just like we're never going to build it, you know, never going to implement Shor's algorithm with those costs, right? One little rotation, 100,000 logical gates. With our tools, we brought it down to 50, which is the information theoretic minimum. And just a really cool, and I don't, I mean, we, we basically broke up the problem. We reversed it because taking unitary, you want to approximate it with something in a finite sub set, we said, well, let's first figure out what's exactly synthesizable and then round off to, to something in this set of exactly synthesizable objects. This was some very nice, uh, simple number theory. This is a sort of Diophantine approximation problem. And in just skipping through it, this really cool thing, my student noticed that, you know, if we give ourselves two ancilla bits, because rounding off to something that is unitary, you know, my gut feeling was this is going to be either trivial or really hard, which is usually the case in computer science. And it turned out to be really a real pain. But he said if you add two bits, the round off problem, because you have to have norm exactly one. You say, how hard, well, how important is that? It's very important. And so it's just an annoying round off problem. But if you add two ancilla bits, you get these extra degrees of freedom. And basically what you need to find is an integer, four integers, A, B, C, and D whose sums of squares equal some number m. And Lagrange, you know, there's the famous Lagrange four squares theorem that says every integer can be decomposed as a sum of four squares. And Jeff Shallot and Michael Rabin in the 80s found an efficient algorithm for that. So we implemented this old algorithm to do these round-offs and show that you could actually efficiently synthesize these things. Now using norm equations and so on in number theory, we got rid of Selinger and, and we've done work on this got rid of the ancilla bit needs, but this was sort of the first result that said with constant, just two extra bits, you can efficiently do this compilation. Now, adding all these tools together and others developed by other people, 
what's the bottom line in terms of how efficiently now, or at least two years ago, we could implement AES cryptanalysis or SHA cryptanalysis. If you take 192-bit AES, you know, hand wavy, we say, oh, it's half the bit strength, so 96 bits. But we estimated it in practice using today's tools. It's about 2 to the 121 surface cycles, surface code cycles. And if you cost those out, it's even higher. So it's not a full, it's a significant reduction. It's not 192 bits security anymore, but it's, it's more than half of that. And similar for SHA. And for RSA, we, we did an analysis a year or two ago and brought it down by the cost of, it, of breaking RSA 2048 by about two orders of magnitude. And subsequent to our work, Gidney at, at Google and Ekara in um, Sweden reduced, shaved off another two orders of magnitude. So the cost of implementing Shor's algorithm for crypt cryptographically relevant parameters has gone down by at least four orders of magnitude in the last short number of years. And of course, it continues to go down. I don't think it's plateaued any time. It's not, it's not plateaued yet. We haven't reached the fundamental limits. So in terms of implementing Shor's algorithm, it's not just how big of a quantum computer do we have? It's how much, of a, how big of a quantum computer do we need? And at some point, these two curves are going to overlap, and we don't know when it, that's going to happen. But when it does happen, of course, it breaks. It decimates public key cryptography that we've currently deployed. It weakens symmetric key. So I'm going to focus on public key because it's still an essential ingredient in most of our digital economy, or essentially all of our digital economy. As an aside, we'll hear a lot in the media and so on about these non-fault tolerant devices that are already being used today, quantum annealers like our friends at D-Wave, simulating quantum physical systems with today's ion traps and so on. We don't know how to cryptanalyze RSA or anything with those, scheme, those computers. We're keeping an eye on it, but they're not a known threat. I have taken a deeper look at this. I didn't just blow it off because it was inconvenient. We, I don't, there's a lot of, many papers with titles that make it, you know, factoring via SAT, you know, just fact, quantum factoring on my annealer. And I, I think, I mean, I was always skeptical about those papers because I really think those are, they're using factoring to help study their SAT solver. The SAT solving is not helping factoring at all. Like when I was an undergrad and my supervisor said, you know, we can solve three sat pretty good on average. I said, well, then wait a minute. That means we can factor. He said, no, it actually doesn't work in practice. In fact, my friends who do sat solving, they sometimes reduce factoring to sat to get hard sat instances. It's a good heuristic for finding a hard sat instance quickly. So which suggests it's not a good heuristic for factoring, right? You don't, intuitively, it doesn't seem wise to take a problem with sub-exponential algorithms and map it to one where the best algorithms are exponential. Doesn't mean it might not work, but we tried it and it doesn't seem to work. Um, something we did that might work, because you know, do you really need 2n qubits to break n-bit RSA? There's no theorem that says that. That's what Shor's algorithm achieves. But we showed here that actually n to the two-thirds qubits are enough to speed up the number field sieve. End of the two thirds logical qubits. It doesn't keep me up at night because we still have to worry about the error correction overhead, though there's been big breakthroughs in the last few years suggesting that might actually work out okay. So it may be, at least asymptotically, there's still a few gaps, but they're not that big anymore. You might only need end of the two thirds qubits to improve the constants in the exponents of the number field sieve which means we can factor bigger numbers than we can today with a classical computer, with a quantum computer doing some of the calculations on the side. <clears throat> and my suggestion to the people trying to factor via quantum sat is mimic what we're doing. Do the smoothness testing. Reduce your smoothness testing to a sat instance. Because then if you get anything better, substantially better, than cl classical sat, you actually have a better number field sieve. That's a challenge problem. Nobody's demonstrated it works, but it seems you only need a little bit of an improvement. Whereas this route, you need a super polynomial improvement in SAT solving. So the quantum SAT solver has to be 
super polynomially, like a lot faster than classical SAT solving for this to be meaningful for factoring. So we continue to study this. <clears throat> we'll see if this works. I'm not, like, we'll monitor it. It's not what worries me the most. <clears throat> so there's a big unknown in when quantum computers are going to break RSA, but <clears throat> we can't wait until it's clear. Because as those of us know, it takes 10 to 20 years to properly design and deploy new crypto across our tool suite. Well, there's all the legacy problems, inter interoperability challenges. This is not a weekend job, it's not a one-year job, it's not a five-year job. So what is the shelf life of the information you protect? So go through all your systems, all your crown jewels, what's the shelf life of that information? X. How long will it take you to migrate that to a quantum resilient system? How many years? Y years. For the next Y years, you're supposed to, so you're stuck with the quantum vulnerable tools. You're supposed to provide X years of confidentiality, say. If X plus Y is bigger than Z, you're not. You're already, you're already too late, right? No, like nothing bad happens immediately, but you know that in, near the end of those Y years, those messages are going to be compromised before their shelf life is over. So people protecting national secrets, trade secrets, any information with a large shelf life <coughs> are already potentially too late. We don't know what Z is, but if Z is 10 to 20 years, in some cases they're already too late. Now, <coughs> we may have heard of the so-called quantum supremacy milestone achieved, uh, claimed by Google. And there's a lot of controversy about the term, <coughs> so, but I don't have time to get into that. Uh, the, the idea is for some very specific proof of concept problem, not likely to be useful in practice, quantum computers can solve it much more efficiently than a, any classical computer today we know of can. So that's sort of a, a concrete demonstration that quantum really can give us some sort of enormous advantage for computation. Now, our friends at IBM said it's not as big of an advantage as our friends at Google said. But there's still an advantage, and to me it's a very important milestone because five years ago, no one could possibly have claimed they're better than classical because whatever they had could be simulated on my laptop. So there was just no sane way to claim. Again, with the annealing potential examples aside, but for the circuit-based models, but now we're at a point where we're really at this crossover point where credible people are making credible claims that they've surpassed what classical could do for a very specific artificial problem, but that's fine. It's an important proof of concept and it's an important milestone. <clears throat> the biggest milestone, which again I think could happen in the next two to four or five years, is getting hundreds of those physical qubits achieving one, two logical qubits. And when that happens, you know, when will that happen? Actually, our friends at BSI uh, funded an excellent report. Uh, by a number of colleagues, including uh, Frank Wilhelm at, at Saarbrücken, Reiner Steinwand in Florida, um, and they've updated it recently, and it just outlines all the challenges and where we are today. Uh, a, a, another study in the United States, again, 200-page report if you want to understand <clears throat> what all the challenges are. Um, there's still a lot of challenges. In 96, at Oxford, during my master's defense, I said, look, it's not going to happen in the next 20 years. But in 20 years, we'll have about 20 qubits, and then we'll have a clearer picture. And the, my 20-year estimate went from 0% to 1% to 10% to now it's over 80%. And I think, you know, most recently, I think it's about a 20% chance all the pieces come together in 10 years. <clears throat> and it's not just guesswork. I have a whole methodology of all the different paths to get there, and I you know, estimate the probabilities of these smaller pieces where there's a little, you know, you have a more, little more confidence in your estimates and integrate it all together and I come up with these numbers. So, which means, you know, obviously there's a four and five chance I think it's not going to happen in 10 years. 20% is far too big a risk to take for something as fundamental as the cryptography underpinning all our digital systems. So it's definitely not an acceptable risk and it's perfectly compatible with statements of like, I don't think this is going to happen in 10 years. <clears throat> but uh, you have to be precise. Do you think it's 99.99% likely not to happen? <clears throat> Would you bet your kid's life on it not happening? Or 
or do you just think you know, it's 40, 51% likely not to happen? So I think we need to be precise. And in this report, you know, we surveyed 22 thought leaders from all around the world, <clears throat> asked them the same question, and produced this histogram. And you'll get the same trend of, you know, in the short term, five years, really you know, less than 1%, around 1% likely. Some people put it at 5 to 30%, but <clears throat> the majority were close to either less than 1% or between 1% and 5%. <clears throat> so the supremacy, you know, so-called quantum supremacy is a bit of a warning shot. <clears throat> you can't break anything with that. There's still a long way to go before we have a fault-tolerant qubit. Once we have the fault-tolerant qubit, if you're not ready, you're in big trouble, I think. Because <clears throat> the scaling is going to be fast, and you can't... So, you know, how long does it take to deploy robust cryptography? I think it's, you're already going to be too late. <clears throat> if you wait till the fault tolerant qubit is achieved. Now, in terms of what you deploy, there's post-quantum algorithms are sort of the plug-in replacement for what we have today. Of course, plug-in replacement makes it sound easy. It's really, really hard because you have different sizes and different performance criteria. It's, it's a really huge effort to de design and deploy post-quantum cryptography. I'm very <clears throat> involved in that. We have a whole team dedicated to cryptanalysis of the proposed candidates. And then there's quantum cryptography, which is not meant to be, it's often, there's all these straw man attacks on QKD out there arguing against points that are not made by anyone serious in the field, right? It's not meant to replace all of post-quantum crypto, it's meant to augment it, right? Where available, you can have key agreement without a computational assumption. That's a very powerful thing to have and a great thing to add to the existing tool chest. And together, you can achieve things you can't achieve separately. And we invented the term quantum safe um, because we we're needing to engage with a broader group of for two reasons. For one, we were at a point where we had to talk to policymakers, business people, and so on and so on. And the existing language didn't really communicate a lot of what the issue was. Because the point is to design something safe, designed to be safe against quantum attacks. And the other reason is the existing language of post-quantum it wasn't clear whether quantum cryptography was included or not. Right? Depending on who you asked and what day of the week it was, it may or may not be. And that's fine. I don't want to hijack other people's term. And, and quantum resistant, to me, makes it sound like, well, if you try hard enough, you'll get in. But you're not going to you know, try hard enough and, and solve, uh, you know, cryptanalyze these schemes. So we invented a new term that, that's caught on to a large extent. So QKD, again, it's just key agreement through an untrusted medium where there's no computational assumption. And today it's largely a point-to-point -point solution. There's small deployments of trusted repeater networks now. The long-term vision, or medium to long-term, it's not like a 50-year vision, this is easier than building a quantum computer, is that you don't need to trust the network. You can, you know, the, the, the quantum network could be operated by somebody you don't trust. You just have to trust the endpoints, just like today's networks. <clears throat> and, you know, a lot of people who are designing systems are just, I think, making their decision based on <clears throat> what we can do today with quantum crypto. I think we need to <clears throat> anticipate where we're going to be in five to ten years with these networks <clears throat> and plan our architectures for that future, at least to be ready to use it. And I have no doubt my physics friends will successfully lobby and implement a quantum internet because it's a very fascinating and wonderful challenge at the cutting edge of physics and engineering. And I think we should prepare to use it to secure our cyber systems. And now's the time. I mean, we, we're, we're not happy with the foundations, how, crypto, you know, how things are implemented today. We wish there was more agility, right, in our cryptography, for example. So a lot of features we wish we designed in from the beginning. It's hard to fix it if it isn't broken. But now, at least logically, it's broken. So there's a chance to design in a lot of the other features we would want in crypto, including privacy features and so on. Now's a great time to get those in there. And adding QKD to the ecosystem is one of the very, very nice to haves that we should include. And here's my chart sort of outlining the trade-offs. I won't have the time to really explain it, but you, you know, security designers have to decide where's the right sweet spot in terms of combining QKD or not. 
like this might be an acceptable, this is the QKD free op configuration and you can reduce your risk by using QKD, but you reduce your convenience too. That's a decision you have to make and, and the decision, the trade-off might change as technology becomes more available and the price goes down. And you have to, you know, some people don't want to try new things. We're not saying stop using ECC, which is FIPS certified, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, at least the implementations. We have to, and you have to do both. And do hybrid key agreement where you do QKD and or post quantum and or ECC and combine them. So now you have to break all of those key agreements to compromise your system. That gives us much greater resilience. And the hardest part, you know, I was talking with Christoph today, like the technological challenges <coughs> to making our software system secure are enormous. Like we don't actually know how to do it, actually, in a very reliable way. We know how to do it a lot better, and to a large extent, we're not even doing it as well as we know how to, right? So the decisions, you know, it, t it takes a lot of time to properly standardize and implement crypto. NIST <coughs> is, is working on standards. And there's their timeline for hopefully by 2022, 23, we'll have the first generation of standards. Etsy, we've been working with for many years in terms of creating awareness and working towards the necessary standards. While many people might conclude, I don't need, it's fine if I don't have post-quantum crypto today, I can do it, leave it for tomorrow, okay. But the doing part is only 10%. The planning is most of the work. So the planning can't wait because you don't get to call time out. When that quantum computing threat is zero to five years away, you don't have time to plan anymore. So you have to get ahead of it. We developed an open source platform to enable testing, experimenting and testing with post-quantum crypto. You also have to think not just of fixing legacy platforms, but emerging platforms. If you want to use a distributed ledger, that's great. If you found a useful case for it, but make sure you have a way to upgrade the signatures to quantum resilient signatures. If you're using aggregate signatures, there really isn't a great alternative that is quantum resilient. We also have an open source uh, quantum QKD network interface that you can use to design, make your systems QKD ready. Right? So when it is available, it's really just a, uh, an option to use it. It's not a whole redesign of your system. Here are some questions I encourage people to ask their vendors. We developed a risk assessment methodology. So just to wrap up, so the risk assessment methodology, if companies and organizations do them, that will outline for them what their next steps should be. And it's their own conclusions, right? And then that will stimulate the necessary discussion between vendors, you know, customers and their vendors. And then the vendors will find their, pro, their, 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 their research challenges and then they can engage with academic groups to solve the research challenges. So one example is what I mentioned, the, the aggregate signatures, you know, if you want to use the BLS schemes because they're so much more efficient, but the post-quantum alternatives, there are some, but they're not going to be good enough for many applications. That's a great challenge for researchers to work on. But, the, you know, this takes time. Uh, so we want to go through, we want to ask all these questions now identify the, 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 the research challenges now so we have time to work on them. So quantum computing, this quantum threat may appear to be just a nuisance for us, right? <clears throat> Everything was fine and now we have to rebuild, you know, and redeploy all this new crypto. <clears throat> but maybe it was a blessing in disguise because many of us wanted to rebuild the crypto with hindsight. You know, hindsight, I'm not criticizing everyone whose shoulders we're standing on. Uh, hindsight's 2020. There's a lot of things we've now learned the hard way, and partly we didn't realize what was going to be at stake. There's a lot of things where we'd like to go back in time and do it better. And realistically, it's hard to do. Except now we have this quantum threat forcing us to rebuild the foundations. So if we do it as part of life cycle management and proactively, we can rebuild the foundations of our cyber systems to be better than they ever would have been, right, without the quantum threat. <coughs> On the other hand, if we rush and do the usual crisis management approach, what we're going to rebuild is even worse than what we have today. There's going to be design flaws, implementation flaws, inter, you know, we're going to lose interoperability, and we're going to be more vulnerable to classical attacks. So things will be worse. So we have a choice. 
and I've been strongly advocating for the last few years, let's be proactive about this, where it's not a rip and replace, rip out and replace. It's just a life cycle management. We identify research problems in advance. We solve them, deploy them in time, and everything. It's a non-event. You know, that's, I think, going to be better for, uh, for our society. So thanks a lot for your attention. Happy to take any questions now and happy to discuss further offline by email or afterwards here in Bochum. Thank you.